by some of the most active citizens in South Africa. Um, we're really glad that we've got the support um, and sponsorship, co-sponsorship of the Mail and Guardian, hence your free newspapers. But please note that they are not for reading now. Uh, I know most of us like to read over our breakfasts, but at the swap breakfast, you listen over your breakfast. Um, I do, of course, want to apologize for the fact that we had to cancel the first breakfast, which was uh, as well as Ima Bavi was going to talk to us. But for obvious reasons beyond his control and beyond our control, um, he was unable to. And we are hoping that one way or another things settle down in some way within Kasatu and that we'll be able to reschedule that for November. We will also have um, an additional breakfast in October, uh, I think it's on the 18th of October, when um, Adam Habib, the Vice-Chancellor of Fitz, will be talking about civil society. Um, so that's the sort of overview of, 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 of um, this semester. But I am delighted to be able to welcome, uh, as in effect, our first speaker, Mark Haywood, um, from uh, the TAC executive, or board, I think, but also from Section 27. Uh, Mark has really been um, at the center of some of the most innovative social movement organizing, engaging with the law, engaging with the state, uh, a series of strategies around um, uh, both confronting and challenging the state, as well as working with arms of the state around HIV AIDS and, and more broadly, and now of course Section 27, taking up a range of human rights uh, uh, issues uh, and using the Constitutional Court and litigation to improve the lives of people in South Africa. So it's wonderful to have you here, Mark. Uh, it's going to be fascinating to hear what you have to say about the National Development Plan. Of course, uh, while, while I'm presiding here, I am doing it in the capacity as Director of SWAP, uh, not as a Commissioner. Uh, I will have an opportunity to speak as a Commissioner a little bit later. Um, and it's over to you, Mark. Can we give him a warm welcome? Uh, in relation to social justice and the Constitution as an instrument that can be used by activists, by trade unionists, by people who believe in uh, social transformation uh, as an instrument for, for struggle. So today gives me the first opportunity and preparing for this lecture has given me the opportunity to try to flesh out my thoughts to some extent. Uh, I will say that it's very much work in progress and I must say in the last few days the more I've read and the more I've begun to construct arguments, the more I've realized, well, there's a big question here and there's a big uh, question there. Uh, I'd also say that what I'm going to do this morning is uh, essentially make a political argument about the law and about the Constitution in relation to society generally and in relation to the NDP in particular. But I'm not actually a lawyer. I've worked with law for 20 years. Uh, so I've smuggled in... Uh, lawyers from section 27 to help with the questions if things get too complicated or too difficult uh, when we get to that particular point of, 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 of the program. I've also changed slightly the title of the presentation uh, and I did this at five o'clock this morning. It was originally titled The Missing Link Using the Constitution to Advance Development. Uh, but the more that I, I looked at the Constitution, uh, and its relation to the NDP, it struck me that it's not a passive advance that the Constitution requires, but an active demand. And it's not just development that the Constitution requires, but it, it is equitable development, and actually that shouldn't say distribution, it should say redistribution. So just to give you a sense of, if I can work out how to... Uh, of where, where I intend to go. I just want to give you a kind of o overview of, of, of the argument. I want to start just by talking about the Constitution uh, and trying to locate the Constitution in, in some of the debates that are taking place. You know, is the Constitution a promise or is it a compromise? Does it 
give power to poor people or does it take power away from poor people? Does it give power to the government or does it take power away from, from the government? What are the implications of saying that the Constitution is the supreme law of South Africa? What does that mean for conduct of government and what does it mean for conduct when we talk about the, the National Development Plan? How the Constitution regulates power. How it regulates public power, how it regulates private power, and how it regulates and empowers citizen power. Once I've said a few words about the Constitution, I then want to turn to the NDP and look at the NDP through the lens of the Constitution, really making three main points. The first is that the NDP is public policy. Uh, the NDP has already been endorsed by the Cabinet. Uh, the Cabinet said that it approved the NDP, but it specifically endorsed, the language is endorsed, the objectives and the 18 targets of, of the NDP. That has implications. And then I want to argue that the problem, or one of the problems with the NDP, is that it doesn't take advantage of the state's constitutional power. And that actually the NDP risks delaying development and equitable redistribution rather than what it is ostensibly intended for. And I want to give some examples of that. I want to specifically talk about equality, about food, about the right to basic education. And all of this begs the question, well, where to with the NDP? And my approach is not to reject the NDP outright. I would argue that the NDP is an important initiative and that it can empower struggle and that it can empower transformation. <coughs> But as it is currently constituted, the NDP is flawed and that the NDP needs to be re-looked at in the light of constitutional imperatives. Now before you think, well, that's all fine, this is all fine talk, I do want to say that the Constitution doesn't enact itself. It's not self-enacting. There's contest around the Constitution, just as there's contest around the National Development Plan. My argument as, a, as an activist, as a social justice activist, is in, ma in making these arguments is that we have to use the Constitution to ensure that we get the type of transformation that, that we want. So I've said a lot about the Constitution, and before I go on, let me just acknowledge, and you won't be able to read this, but, but you know, the Constitution's not uncontested. And again, this is one of the reasons why I wanted this opportunity to, to, to speak today. There are really three schools of thought. I mean, there's probably about a hundred schools of, of, of thought about the Constitution. <coughs> one school of court thought says the Constitution is an instruction for transformation, for equality, for people's dignity, etc. And, you know, I was with Zuelin Zima Vavi in Vishu last Friday, marching to the uh, provincial government. And Vavi made the speech, which I hadn't heard him say before, use this type of language before, where he said, Constitution wasn't just written at the Consti Constituent Assembly. Constitution was written in prisons. Constitution was written when we were building organizations. Constitution came out of struggle. And the Constitution captures the results that we sought from, from, from struggle. Similarly, Vali Musa, in an interview or in a, a lecture that he gave uh, a few weeks ago at a conference, so, you know, even went further and said on the contentious issue of the property clause, we put the property clause in there deliberately. The property clause wasn't a compromise. The property clause was also about protecting black people's property and preventing the type of dispossession that took place in the past. But whilst there's that argument, there's also another argument that has been expressed most clearly by uh, uh, Noako Ramaklodi. Uh, a few years ago, and Ramit Claudi said the Constitution was part of a, a fatal compromise that was foisted upon us in the political negotiations. And in his language, the Constitution result is, results in empty political power, that we have little power left, the Constitution migrates power away from the people and away from the government, puts it into the hands of the judiciary, puts it into the hands of civil society, and, and, and so on and so on. I think that's complete uh, nonsense to make that type of, of, of a suggestion, but it's being made by powerful, powerful people. And then, 
uh, there's an argument that Carl has made uh, previously, which I think is a, is a very powerful argument. You won't be able to read it, but what it says is it's unclear how far the constitutions and the institutions it establishes are adequate to facilitate redistribution, since the ANC in government has hardly tested the possibilities. And I think that's the critical point. The ANC in government <coughs> has hardly tested the possibilities. And my argument about the NDP is that the NDP is further evidence of, of, of a conservatism, conservatism that doesn't test the possibilities, that doesn't al allow you to utilize the powers that are, are, are granted to the government by, by the Constitution. So that's what people say about the Constitution. What does the Constitution say about itself? Well, the Constitution says it's the supreme law of South Africa. I'm not being legalistic, but the supreme law is the supreme law. Supreme law means there's nothing higher. Zuma's not higher. Parliament's not higher. I'm not higher. God's not higher. Uh, the Constitution is the supreme law. The Constitution dictates how we govern this, this, th th this country. And what I've always thought is important, or one of the things that's important about the Constitution is that it doesn't just talk about setting up a democratic state and democratic values. In the preamble, it talks about three things. It says, establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. So the supreme law makes an immediate connection with social justice. Social justice means equality, it means equality of opportunity. <coughs> social justice means a decent education system, a decent healthcare system, it means dignity for people who are poor and for, and, and for people who are marginalized. And I think we have to keep in mind this injunction around social justice. You can have democracy without social justice. In fact, in many countries, that is the character of democracy. You vote. You don't participate, you vote. There's nothing about social justice. We're instructed to move towards social justice. Now, now how are we instructed to move towards social justice? And, and this is what I, I find you know, interesting and, and, and something that perhaps hasn't been properly uh, explored, is that the Constitution is very clear in, in how it regulates and directs p power and the use of power, particularly in the way that it is linked to social justice. And, and I can see that in three areas. And because time is short, I'm not going to elaborate on each one. I'll just quickly squeeze through. I want to stop, though, on the issue of private power for a couple of minutes. But the Constitution regulates public power. For example, Section 195 of the Constitution says people's needs must be responded to and the public must be encouraged to participate in policy, policy making. And remember, that's the supreme law, remember? People's needs must be responded to. Public administration must be accountable. And then something that I haven't put in a slide here, which is relevant when we come to discussing the NDP, the Constitution says that all obligations must be performed diligently and without delay diligently and without delay. So does that mean that we can wait, for example, to 2030 until we ha have constructed roofs on schools and put toilets in schools? You know, are we allowed to take what would effectively be 36 years to meet the basic needs? Is that diligent and, and, and without delay? But here's the argument, and here is something that, 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 that I think is, that has been controversial. Uh, um, and it is a particular area where the NDP doesn't take advantage of, of uh, okay. where the NDP doesn't take advantage of a power that the Constitution gives the state against private power. And I think one of the unfortunate things that we've seen in activism, although perhaps necessary, over the last 20 years is that a lot of activism has been directed at the state and, hasn't, and has not been directed at private power. And in fact, in certain respects, because there's been this focus on the state and because there's been this decay of the state and this corruption of the state in many respects, it's also arguable that private power has got home scot-free, that there has been very, very little 
attention on the, on, the, on the conduct of private power in relation to the Constitution. But the Constitution, first of all, says it has horizontal application. In non-lawyer's language, that means that all these things about rights, etc., are not just obligations on the government. They're also obligations and create duties on the private sector and on, on, on private business. It gives the state power to take reasonable legislative and other measures to advance the objectives of the, of, of the Constitution. Now, again, some people may think, well, that's very conservative. What's reasonable, legislative, and other measures? But other measures can go quite far. And reasonable simply means that those measures must be arbitrary and properly thought out. But it doesn't mean that they are limited if there is a purpose about alleviating poverty or giving people access to healthcare services, etc. Constitution regulates labor relations. That's obvious. I don't need to discuss it to this, with, with, with this audience. On property, you know, Carl, this is perhaps something that we should come back to in, in future, but, but one of the biggest arguments that's made about why the Constitution is a sellout and the compromise is about the property clause, section 25. <coughs> the property clause keeps property in the hands of the people who stole property, it prevents development, etc. Et but if you actually, but, but, but this is, a, for me, this is an area which goes back to Carl's point which is that the possibilities haven't been tested. But in the limited amount that the Constitutional Court has said on the property clause, it said things like this. Under the 1996 Constitution, the protection of property as an individual right is not absolute but subject to societal considerations. More recently, it says, this brings to the fore the obligation imposed by Section 25 not to overemphasize property rights at the expense of the state's social responsibilities. It must always be remembered that our history does not permit a near absolute status to be given to individual property rights to the detriment of the equally important duty on the state to ensure that all South Africans partake <coughs> of the benefits flowing from our mineral and petroleum resources. Those are the words of the Constitution, of the Constitutional Court, when it comes to this issue of, 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 of property rights. Similarly, you can see in relation to access to health care and access to housing, specifically in relation to access to, to health care, the, the Constitutional Court has supported the right of the state to intervene against private property when it comes to the question of regulating the price of medicines in order to ensure that medicines are affordable and that, that the provision of medicines can meet with the requirements of, 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 of access to healthcare services. So my argument is there is power is given to us and given to the state to take reasonable measures against private property and private business if that is necessary for the interest of narrowing inequality and so on <coughs> and so on. But that power is, is, is not being used. Because I'm going to run out of time, I, I'm not going to have time to explain this, this slide, but what I do want to just quickly say is that in a number of, in a number of judgments, the Constitutional Court has actually set out the parameters for public policy, and I don't believe that the NDP meets those parameters. So, for example, in the famous case that's called Krutboom, which was about the right of access to housing, one of the things that the court said is that there's a duty to identify and respond to people's urgent needs. And my question, and I'll come to this in a minute, is that if you know that there are 12 million people in South Africa who are hungry on a daily basis, is that or is that not an urgent need? And does that or does that not create an immediate duty to take steps, including steps against the producers of food, the retailers of food, in order to try to alleviate the wide-scale hunger that exists, within, that exists within the country. It's said that there must be budgets. Very importantly, recently, Constitutional Court has said, and this also applies to the NDP cult, that you can't just say we don't have available resources for a particular social program. That's not sufficient. If you're going to make an argument that we don't have available resources, then you have to show that there are not available uh, resources. And probably one of the arguments about the NDP as a whole is that you can't have a more radical, more transformative document because there are not resources available to the state to meet people's social, meet people's social need. So coming now for the last 10 minutes, if I'm allowed, just quickly to this issue of, of, of the NDP. And now for something completely different. I had that thought at about 3 o'clock this morning. Uh, 
As I said already, the National Development Plan is, is public policy. Because it's public policy, we are entitled to scrutinize it and ask questions about it, of course, in the abstract. But we're also entitled to, to subject it to the glare of does it meet these requirements that I've, that, that, that I've been talking about. I don't think the National Development Plan understands the Constitution. I mean, I, f I find it quite remarkable that it's not framed by the Constitution. Uh, I find it remarkable that it doesn't seem to understand whether the Constitution is a vision or an obligation. And there's a big difference. If the Constitution is just an aspiration, okay, someday we'll all go to heaven, someday we'll get socialism, and so on and so on. That's very different from something... <laughs> sorry. That's very different from something that says today you have to take steps around equality, around equity, etc., etc. Et, et um, and then finally, I just want to spend five minutes on why I would argue that the National Development Plan compromises on a number of fundamental rights. Because what it tends to do is to postpone a lot of social needs to resolution in the indefinite future rather than set out targets for resolution of social needs and the means by which social needs will be resolved in the near future. And let, let me give you just a few examples of, of, of that. You know, uh, one of the, I, I think, the critique of the Constitution that has been made by <coughs> Neil Coleman from Pasati, of the particularly of the economic aspects of the con Constitution, is, is a very uh, strong critique. Uh, and there's a recent publication, which I don't know if everybody's seen, produced by something called the Progressive Economist Network, linked to the AIDC, which has seven articles critiquing the Constitution, one of them by Neil. But I've already talked, <coughs> talked about the fact that, that equality is, 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 a, is, a, is a vein that runs through the Constitution, and equality was what we all struggled for. The NDP proposes that by 2030, and this is in the list of uh, key objectives, the Gini coefficient will have been reduced from 0.69% to 0.6%. So we go from being the very, very, very most unequal country in the world to being the very, very most unequal country in the world. <laughs> no major reduction envisaged in inequality. I would argue that that, is not, that, 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 that that puts a spear through the heart of the NDP in and of itself. Because if you can't set more ambitious targets around the reduction of, of, of inequality, then what's the point of, of, of starting it in the first place? The second thing, just to remind you of what I've said about meeting urgent needs, is that the NDP offers only when it comes, it recognizes food insecurity, it recognizes hunger, it talks about the importance of nutrition and various programs, but in quite vague and abstract, idealistic terms, not in concrete terms. So it says that, by, that no one should suffer poverty-induced hunger, thus no one should live below the poverty line of 419 Rand, doesn't say anything more than that. Again, Neil Coleman points out that that's not really the poverty line. But the point is that that's, that's abstract. And it's abstract particularly in a context where we know, as I've said, this is from a recent report issued by the Human Sciences Research Council, that, that you know, in the Eastern Cape, 36% of people experience hunger. And in Pumalanga, 29% of people experience hunger. There's another graph that I'm not going to show you that says those are the people who experience hunger. There's another level of people who are at risk of serious hunger. And that's also in the 20% and, and, and so on and so on. And the fact of the matter from also recent research that I've seen is that in South Africa today, a month's sufficient nutritious food for a family of four has been costed out at 7,000 rand a month. Conservatively costed out at scientifically but conservatively at 7,000 rand a month. Now, if those are the facts, how do you address those, how does the NDP address those facts? And why isn't there a utilization of 
this power that you have, for example, against the retailers. Because again, research that has been done here at WITS is showing that it's the stitching up of the food market by four main retailers and the way that they are able to control the distribution and supply chain all the way down to the small farmer that has, that has an effect on food prices and, and makes affordability of food the major determinant as whether people can buy food or not. That's a case for, 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 for immediate action. On basic education, this is just some pictures, you can't see them properly, but these are our school toilets in Limpopo uh, as, as it is today. Uh, you know, some of them look like Roman toilets, some of them are just full of shit, some of them are falling down. The NDP says that school infrastructure must be sorted out by 2016, which is promising and, and, uh, and, and progressive. Uh, the only problem is that the recently published norms and standards for school infrastructure say that school <coughs> infrastructure norms and standards will only be met by 2030. So, again, if the NDP is supposed to be guiding uh, government policy, why is it that the NDP promises the immediate realization of an aspect of the right to basic education, but recently published guidelines postpone it to, to 2030? And I would say here, I mean, these are some of the facts about our, our schools. 31% of schools don't have a math teacher, 25%, only 25% have, have a library. But what's important to know here, going back to the Constitution, is that the right to basic education is not something that's allowed to be progressively realized. There's a duty to provide basic education that started in 1996, at the point that the Constitution was passed. Quality basic education. And that means that the resources have to be found by one means or another to provide people with, young people with the education that they are entitled to. And the consequences, the social consequences of not doing this are catastrophic and are enormous for dignity and equality and productivity and a range of other, range of other things. So now I'm just going to come quickly to, to, to the con to, to conclusion. The, the NDP puts quite some emphasis on active citizenry. I mean, active citizenry is becoming a bit of a cliche. Everybody talks about it from Mampela to us and so on and so on. Um, but it says active citizenry and social activism is necessary for democracy and development to, to flourish. But again, where you find a lacuna is that whilst there's this recognition of active so-called active citizenship, in 484 pages, there's only two pages on access to the courts. And access to the courts and access to justice are critical if poor people are able to remedy violations that are being undertaken against them by companies, by the environment, and, and so on, and, and, and so on. So at the level of rhetoric, rhetoric active citizenship, citizenry is very nice, but there's, nothing, there's very little practical. And again, it comes down to resource issue. What would it cost to provide people with access to justice? I'm almost, I'm almost finished off. Uh, Fine, just final two points of, of, of critique. Um, th these are two uh, diagrams that are, are, are taken from the NDP. NDP puts forward the idea of a minimum standard of living, which is an interesting idea that perhaps we should debate. My question is, is it permissible to progressively realize a minimum standard of living? I mean, it doesn't make sense, you know? You can progressively realize a maximum standard of living, but the notion that there has to be years of progressive realization to get to the floor seems highly problematic. So the theoretical construct is difficult. I, I put the rings around here. So, so this is the approach to change. So at the heart of the cog is active citizenry, effective government, strong, strong leadership. But there are mechanisms sufficient for active citizenry. And that then turns things around. But then we get to this idea of the minimum standard of living and, and, and the table, I mean the diagram shows these various parts of a minimum standard of, of living. But again, it doesn't recognize that these are rights. Now these are not aspirations. These are rights. So the right to a healthy environment is a, it's a right and it creates duties. So actually there's a state duty to halt what the extractive industries are doing 
in the Northwest, and that state duty has existed since 1996, because the people, the mine workers, the communities have a right there to a healthy, healthy environment. As I said, there's a right to nutrition, there's a right to education, there's a right to health care, there's a right to, to, to housing and water. You can't water these, these rights down and then place them on a floor and then say what we're going to try to do is to progressively lift people so that they can get to the floor of what constitutes a, what, what constitutes a, a decent living. So just to, to conclude, the argument that we would make, uh, to, particularly to, to, to comrades interested in committed to social justice, is that actually we have to relook at the National Development Plan. We do need a plan. And underneath the plan, we need many plans. There need to be many plans with budgets. You can't just have one big Uber plan. You need a big Uber plan, yes. But there needs to be a specific plan around basic education, a specific plan around access to healthcare services, a specific plan around food, etc., etc. But we are not going to get that if we don't exercise our own power. That's the point, because power is contested. And that's why we need to go back to the fundamentals that are part of the Constitution, the right to campaign for a cause. That's in Section 19. It doesn't just say right to campaign for a political party. It says right to campaign for a cause. The right to strike, of course, which is under threat in certain respects, whether it's through the violence against strikers or whether it's through attempts to expand so-called uh, minimum service level agreements. And then this issue of access to the courts. And I always put access to the courts. Please don't believe that we have a fetish about courts or, or legal struggle, etc. For us, use of courts and legal struggle is, is, a, is, is intimately linked with social mobilization of people around their rights. And that's where I want to finish and just say that I, I would argue that, that, that social mobilization linked to the Constitution does deliver elements of, of social transformation. And I just want to say on that, you know, to bring it right up to yesterday, that you know, two weeks ago we published this report on called Death and Dying in the Eastern Cape, uh, which is a very graphic report about how uh, uh, what's happened to the Eastern Cape healthcare system over the last 10 years. And we presented it to the Minister of Health, uh, Aaron Moxoledi, always with the threat of litigation in our back pocket, which he knows well uh, and doesn't like. And we marched in Bishu with 2,000 people last Friday. And amazingly, the result yesterday, well, the result, the immediate result was that the Minister of Health sent people to the Eastern Cape, a task team. They fired a hospital CEO. They fired a district manager who's destroyed the OR Tambo district. And they're putting in, Motsuladi announced yesterday, that they're putting in a billion rand immediately to try to fix aspects of the Eastern Cape healthcare system. Now, that wouldn't come about, in my argument, without mobilize, a mobilized citizenry. But you can't have a mobilized citizenry in abstract. You need a mobilized citizenry that takes advantages of powers. And for me, the powers, the most important powers, are the powers that, are, that exist in the Constitution and that seem to get dissipated in the National Development Plan. So uh, let me stop there. Thank you. Mm. Thanks, Mark, for burning the midnight oil to get this to us. Uh, fantastic, a sense of very, a very deep analysis and set of thoughts around the Constitution and the National Development Plan. Um, now you can recharge glasses, get a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, come back, and we will open for discussion and comments from the floor. A uh, hand at the back there. I just want to find out, uh, in terms of uh, your active citizenship, what recourse do we have to follow up on forensic audits, particularly of municipalities, where we've literally been defrauded of um, our tax money uh, by public officials who are allegedly putting up toilets and so on, but nothing's happening, particularly in places like Eastern Cape. Great. Um, another question, comment, controversy, disagreement, counter proposition. Mark. Okay. 
Okay, um, just on, on the issue of uh, forensic audits. It's a good thing Adele Kirsten is there somewhere, but you know, the interesting thing about local government is that people actually have a lot of power, theoretically, at the level of local government, uh, both through the constitution, but also through the legislation that exists at, at, at that level. But people don't know about that power, and they're not organizing around that power in relation to IDPs, uh, in relation to how the budget gets uh, formulated at local government level, in relation to the decisions about where the budget focuses resources. And when it comes to things like forensic audits regarding municipalities or access to those forensic audits, then again, you know, people have a right of access to information. You can't be denied information that has a bearing on people's rights. One of the problems, and, and, and make this point squarely because I'm not an uncritical believer in law, is that this thing called the Promotion of Access to Information Act is a bad piece of legislation that actually makes it very cumbersome and tedious and in fact in some ways, it's meant to frust frustrates the ability to get get access to that information. So, I think it has to be a combination again of local mobilisation around the issue around the corruption of local expose, but then combined in some ways with with use of law and use of, of, of legal rights. You know, we I don't know if you've seen it. A couple of years ago, we produced this book called An Activist Guide to Making Local Government Work. Um, uh, uh, and what that attempts to do is to show, is to show people all the powers that they have at, at local <coughs> government. Because it's very clear, as you can see with all of the service delivery uprisings that Carl and Adele and people wrote in this uh, publication called The Smoke That, the smoke that calls. 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 The Smoke That Calls. You know, and, and as you see in the latest police statistics, you know, there's three service del delivery uprisings a day, or that, that's the old statistic. But what tends to happen is you have a violent uprising that is suppressed or burns out. And once it's been suppressed or burnt out, very often the old relations re-establish themselves and people find themselves in the same disempowered position that they were uh, at the point when, they were, when, when things became so bad that they, there was this spontaneous uprising. Uh, right at the back there. It has been clear for the most part that uh, the NDP has been very successful on the eyes of its authors. So I'd like to know what is it that needs to be done to show them the flaws that this paper has and to acknowledge that there are flaws that is to be changed. Thank you. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, Oh, oh um, our cameraman is saying that when you ask a question or speak from the floor, can you please stand up so that you become visible? So maybe, maybe you just go through that again as a second time. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying it has been clear that uh, the NDP has been very successful on the eyes of its, of its authors. So there are many flaws that are there. How do we, what is it that needs to be done to show them and make them acknowledge that there are flaws that needs to be changed in that, in that thing? But thank you. Okay, there was, a, the, uh, there was a hand at the back here. Okay, the arc, is that Kelly? Yeah. Okay, up you get. I'm Kelly Forrest and I'm a SWAP associate researcher. Um, I have a feeling, you know, departments have been developing their own programs for years. And I have a feeling that even if the NDP comes into being, they'll just continue with their programs. So I wonder whether you shouldn't rather be looking at departmental programs, which should be also, as you were saying, public knowledge in the light of the Constitution. I just wonder whether you could comment on that. And Jesse, you had your hand up. Hi, I'm Justin Golder, and I'm a law student here at um, Vince. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the issue of private power um, and um, what kind of organizing work we should be doing. I mean, part of the reason some of these changes haven't happened is not just because the government doesn't want to do them, but because there's opposition to them from other arenas. Um, and so what kind of organizing work or strategies um, should we be mobilizing around who are the sort of key people that we need to get out of the way, so to speak, so that some of these things become more possible? 
then next to you, I think, yeah. Thank you. Roger Roman, Dan, please. Mark, I'd be interested in hearing what you think about the NDP as a site for activism. Clearly, there's a role for the Constitution to be a site for activism. <coughs> By engaging, if, if a community struggling for land, for example, engages with the NDP, is that in some ways not precisely what the government wanted them to do? To engage with a neoliberal little plan that is all theoretical of what happened anyway, rather than getting involved in real service delivery and real protest and real active citizenry. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, what to do to show the flaws? I, I mean, there's debate about the flaws of the NDP, and that, you know, there's public media about the flaws of the NDP, but it's not clear to me whether anything is going to be done. It's said that it's not set in stone, but it probably is set in stone in, in, in some respects, unless there's a push of serious critique. And, you know, Roger, for me that partly goes to your question. I think this is an opportunity for organized labor, organized civil society, social justice organizations to change the, to shift the agenda and to advance social justice if there's a proper coordinated response to the NDP. At the moment, you know, Kasatu has, has, has taken a critical position, which is great. A few other people have taken positions, but nobody's actually linking up and saying, okay, well, what are we going we gonna to do about it? At the recent Alliance Summit, it said, okay, well, we'll re-look at the economic chapters of, of, of the NDP, which I didn't touch on today. Uh, but, but nobody said we'll re-look at the social chapters of the NDP, which I've tried to show you are, are hugely problematic and, and, and in many respects a, a step backward. And, and for me that shows you know, something that's becoming more and more apparent in South Africa at the moment, which is that, that the labor movement, whatever that is at the moment, uh, social justice organizations, civil society, progressive faith-based organizations, they need to find a, a common voice again. There needs to be a finding of a, of, of a shared uh, agenda if these things are to, be, uh, are, are to be dealt with. But I think if there isn't this criticism of the NDP, then we're in trouble because it, it locks us, to some extent, it locks us into a, into, into a social reverse path rather than, 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 than a growth path. Kelly, you know, d departments developing their own programs. As I said, my argument would be that you need a much slimmer national development plan, a much tighter national framework, and that underneath the national framework you need sectoral or department, serious sectoral or departmental programs, which again don't postpone everything to the indefinite future. You've got to identify and meet urgent needs. You know, if we don't as a country meet the hunger need, what, what are we, we, we going to do? But the problem, perhaps Carl, well, we were talking about this in the break, is that there's very, in many <coughs> government departments now, some have just been hijacked by corrupt elements, almost totally hijacked. In others, there's very limited capacity, particularly when you get to provincial level. You know, we were, <coughs> I was in Polahuani yesterday or the day before meeting with the NEC for basic education. And that, with colleagues, and that was, it was, you came out of that meeting feeling deflated because there's a bunch of bureaucrats with no vision and no idea of how to get to a vision. And they said to us, look, you come here to talk about school toilets. We don't have one engineer in the, in the Limpopo Provincial Education Department who's capable of constructing a plan to develop school toilets. So what they do is they farm it out to all sorts of private companies that produce shoddy toilets that fall down a few months after they've been erected and don't meet basic standards. So, that, that, so, so I agree that there is a need to focus on departments, but there's problems associated with that as well. The other thing is, that, is the interlinking of departments and therefore the need for the interlinking of, 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 of plans. So if you take health, for example, you go to a rural province like the Eastern Cape, you know, you can't separate the right of a person of access to a clinic with the duty to build a road that gets to that clinic. 
So sometimes you've got a clinic on the top of a hill, but there's no road to the clinic. So old people, disabled people, etc., can't get up the hill. Which again, take, go, for me, goes back to this issue of local government, because from what we've studied of local government, there's such pilfering of resources <coughs> of local government. It's not an absolute shortage of means to, to build roads. It's the, the resources are being pilfered because the people don't know how the systems are meant to, to work and are therefore, are, are therefore vulnerable to, to that. Um, uh, the last thing on, on private power, again, if we're going to confront private power, not just for the sake of, of confrontation, but for the purposes of controlling private power, so that private resources go to people who need it, and are not just this massive skimming of, of, of the cream of these high profit levels, there's got to be some organization. Attacks on private power have been very ad hoc if they've taken place at all. So, you know, if Casada doesn't mind me criticizing, you know, Casada organized marches a few years ago about food prices. But you march people to the top of the hill and then you get them to the top of the hill and then you forget about the issue. There's no sustaining of the challenge. There's no serious critical analysis of what is going on that is put out in public that empowers people to see, actually, I'm not hungry because there's a shortage of food in South Africa. I'm hungry because of the way food is, 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 is structured. You know, there's a very good example at the moment that's just coming up. You know, we've, we've managed over a number of years to persuade the Competition Commission to carry out a market inquiry into pricing in the private healthcare sector, uh, uh, which could be, you know, people are being ripped off, as everybody knows, in the, in, massively in the private healthcare sector by hospitals and by specialists, etc. That could be a, a, a really important opportunity to flush out what is going on and to put downward pressure on pricing and on, on conduct of, 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 of the private uh, healthcare sector. At the moment, there is a big war. All the private companies, hospitals, the net cares are lawyered up. They're trying to stop this market inquiry from even starting. I mean, I'm not at liberty to disclose all of the details, but I can tell you, they want to kill it before, they don't even want it to start. Literally, they don't want to start. So, you know, why are we not able to engage in that? And if we were able to control private resources in health, it would free more resources for public, for the, for, for the public's healthcare system, and also result in some sort of, some sort of transfer, transference. Um, and I think I've dealt with the issue of the NDP. As a, as a, we've got to engage the NDP, but as it is, the NDP is very different from the Constitution. You can use the Constitution to fight. You can't go with this big document <laughs> and use it to fight because it's too diffuse and too internally contradictory and, and, and so on. Um, okay, Tony. Yes. <coughs> Tony Davis. I um, think that there's a definite need surfacing for the NDP to be rewritten. And it could be rewritten on the basis of social activism if somebody who with a good planning mind, would that be you, could, could appoint teams or a small group or a couple of people to examine a particular part, rather like the way in which the uh, Bible was translated into the authorized version. Some of you may know how it was done. <laughs> because we are suffering from an excess of words and too little thought and writing and distillation. And if you go back to uh, Peter Jeffrey's book, Never Again, or to the actual text of the Beverage Commission, and you look at Britain in the five years after the Second World War and measure its achievements, right? That is the sort of process that we need to meet the urgent needs of the people who live above our mineral resources in the case of the Limpopo province. <coughs> Great, Tony. Thanks. There's a hand out there. Okay, uh, Kimani. Uh, thanks a lot, Carl. Uh, Kimani Jung from the Foundation for Human Rights. Uh, mine is a well, political question, but I guess all questions are political, and it's on race and leadership. 
Now, one of the ringing criticisms against um, the very active civil society organizations is that they are essentially a bunch of white liberals you know, worrying about the black condition. And to you, Mark, you know, we, we respect your work. I, I have known you know, the kind of work that Mark and others have done uh, for quite a long time. But are these questions that you reflect on in your mind, and if so, what do you do about that? I mean, that's a soft underbelly, not just you as Mark, but that's a soft underbelly for any civil society organization uh, that gets accused of you know, being a classical white man's bad. You know, we are poor blacks, and not help. Thanks. Um, Jackie, Jackie. Um, Mark, can, can I bring you back to, I thought it really, well it was a great presentation, thanks very much, but I was especially interested in what you pointed out in the beginning about how much of our mobilization is directed at the state. And I'm not sure that there's a, not a whole lot of sort of Don Quixote politics going on. Because I don't think it's an accident that the um, one oversight, that the NDP <coughs> is so committed to maintaining high levels of inequality. Yeah. Because the 0.6 will, as you absolutely correctly pointed out, still be the worst in the world of major uh, developed societies. But if we look at the class interests that the NDP represents, isn't, aren't there a whole lot of political implications that follow from that? Given that, I mean, the class polarization that's happened in our society, the class interests that um, are entrenched, shouldn't we perhaps be, not be devoting the extraordinary amount of energy and resources that we are devoting and that SWAP is devoting to by having this series of, of, of discussions about a failed and class biased document which fails to address the absolutely central issue in our society, which is the, in, the deepening inequality which, which affects every aspect of our social, political, and economic life. Um, anyone else on this round or not? Uh, there's a hand at the back there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tawanda from Zimbabwe, which might influence my question. <laughs> At the beginning, you spoke about redistribution, and um, uh, could you?